uh, for the good governance of the construction industry. Senator Ayres. Acting Deputy President, well, I suppose, um, having listened uh, to some of this discussion over the course of the last several hours, uh, I've been tempted into pointing a few things out. And I might take the time to point a few things out without unnecessarily prolonging this uh, obvious filibuster attempt. I can tell you that um, my history uh, in the labour movement and my engagement with the construction industry says that there is a very important place for strong and effective trade union representation, whether you lot like it or not, uh, in the construction industry. Um, there is a history in the construction industry of mindful militancy, uh, a focus on safety, a focus on safety, and a focus, a focus on the interest of members, and a focus on uh, good jobs in the construction industry. And I say. I used that phrase earlier because it's a phrase that I associate with the tradition in, my, in the organisation that I once worked in, uh, that while others on the other side might not have liked some of the things uh, that we did, and in fact some on the other side worked hard to change industrial relations regulation to uh, disadvantage workers uh, in industrial relations. Uh, I was very proud indeed of that tradition. Now, some of the behaviour that's been set out by some, you know, quite eloquently, allegations that have been made, uh, of course, if proven, is utterly unacceptable. Um, the answer to that, of course, is not the continued operation of the ABCC. It is a failed, partisan, hyper-partisan regulator. It does not have the confidence of participants in the building industry, not limited to just the trade unions in the industry, although their voice in this is important, but there is a broad view in the community that this regulator cannot be trusted to act in any other way but a hyper-partisan uh, and unfair way, and that it has failed, if its objective is indeed to prevent bad behaviour in the construction industry, well, it has utterly failed. The problem with the argument being made over there in the attempt to establish that there is some vested interest here, there is no vested interest. There is just a clear and unambiguous view. It's not been hidden. It's not new. It was in the lead-up, not just to the last election, but the election before. This failed, hyper-partisan regulator is not fit for purpose in the construction industry. Now, there are bad behaviours by industry participants in the construction industry. There are some workplaces in the construction industry that have a bad culture. And I would have thought that people would have paid attention to the Jobs and Skills Summit last week and seen that the answer to these problems is not a hyper-partisan failed regulator, a police force that goes around telling people what stickers they can have on their helmets or what flags they can fly or whether they can, whether they can meet or not meet. That's what, that's what this failed hyper-partisan regulator has done. Those over on this side don't have the faintest interest in productivity in the construction industry. It is just a continuation of the hyper-ideological obsessions of that group. But what's really going on here this evening? This isn't a genuine debate about how to create good jobs in the construction industry. Nobody on that side has ever had the remotest interest in good jobs and productivity in the construction industry. This is a full-scale filibuster from an opposition who can't help but delay and divide and distract 
when it comes to climate policy. That's what all this is really about. Not only did the coalition's climate wars in government see total policy paralysis and political division for more than a decade, now they're clinging on to this sentiment and this strategy from opposition. Well, keep it coming, because people see it for what it is. The Liberal Party and National Party in this place have spent hours of Senate time railing on the disallowance of the Building Work Amendment Code. So far, we've heard from at least 10 coalition senators on this disallowance, all speaking for 15 minutes each. That's one opposition senator. That's one opposition senator for every year of the wasted decade when it comes to climate, failed climate and failed energy policy in this country. And why are they doing that? Well, perhaps it's because they don't want this Senate to debate a bill on climate emissions that would see Labor's 43 per cent emissions reduction target enshrined in law. The best that they've got is delay and it's inherently partisan and self-interested and political. That's what this behaviour is really about. It's not in the public interest. It's to engage an ideological obsession which still holds the majority in the Liberal Party, led by the fanatics on the backbench who are determined to drive what remains of Peter Dutton's, Mr Dutton's leadership into the ground. Now, the National Party, the National Party and Mr Pitt are clearly still in control of the Leader of the Opposition's policy unit. This lot over here will never change. They don't listen to the Australian community. They didn't get the memo in the last election that people want to see action on climate change and they want to see Australians working together to resolve the issues that confront them, whether it's in the construction industry or anywhere else. They simply won't learn. Uh, I think we should have a vote on this matter. That's my view. We should get on with the business uh, that this chamber needs to deal with over the course of this week. And in the interest of doing that, at the halfway mark, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I'll sit down. Senator Chandler. Deputy President, um, and I do always enjoy a contribution from Senator Ayres with his uh, misty-eyed recollections of his time in the union movement. Um, we've heard it many times in this chamber, and I saw when he stood up tonight that I suspected we were about to get it again, and indeed we did. I am glad, Senator Ayres, that you recognised this evening in your contribution um, that some bad behaviour has occurred. Um, and I'm glad that you again recognise that there are uh, that there's uh, some bad cultural issues in some elements. I I'm very pleased to hear you recognise that. But uh, then, once again, um, through you, Madam Acting Deputy President, we had another government senator reverting to the standard Labor talking points of blame shifting while ad neglecting to address the very serious issue that we are examining here this evening, and that is the threat that Labor has proposed to the very existence of the body that can regulate that very same bad behaviour that Senator Ayres referred to, the ABCC. Madam Acting Deputy President, here we are uh, only into the third sitting week of the Labor government, and we are already seeing Labor capitulate to the bidding of their union masters. Instead of concentrating on the issues that are affecting everyday Australians, like cost of living pressures being felt by households around the country, Labor have instead focused their attention on appeasing their union mates. At a time when Australian families are doing it tough, this is what Labor are proposing as one of their bright new ideas. I've been listening, Madam, uh, my apologies, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, to the contributions of other senators in this place this evening, and I'm sure that uh, those good Australians listening to those contributions at home would be quite shocked at what they are hearing, although it should be said that all of the stories here this evening in relation uh, to 
certain behaviour from the union movement are matters of public record. And I want to remind those Australians listening at home that the ABCC was established for very good reasons. Uh, it was established to curtail union lawlessness, protect construction workers from thuggish behaviour and intimidation, and to stop the harassment of workers both on and off work sites, particularly women. But as we have heard here this evening, Mr Acting Deputy President, there are some truly terrible instances which paint a clear picture as to why this body, the ABCC, is essential to protect uh, those who work in these industries, uh, to protect them from the sheer thuggery of some individuals in the Australian union movement. And as many of my colleagues have addressed here this evening, and I do want to make a couple of remarks on this myself, there is no greater example of that than the truly disgusting and despicable actions of the CFMMEU. As we've heard throughout this debate, CFME, CFMMEU officials have previously been caught out uh, cursing at, spitting at uh, individuals, threatening to gang rape and even kill women. Uh, a CFMMEU official was jailed for assault and once told a female inspector she was an effing S, uh, asked her if she had brought knee pads as she was going to be sucking off these effing dogs all day. CFMMEU delegates were accused of harassing the daughter of a builder when they picketed a work site. The picketers were accused of harassing the daughter of the builder when she entered the site in her car by commenting on her appearance, her breasts and her bottom, and making inappropriate sounds towards her. They allegedly called her a daddy's girl and a blonde bimbo. And they said, here comes the freeloader living off your dad. That car belongs to us because daddy pays for it. These are truly horrific stories, Mr Acting Deputy President. This behaviour would not be tolerated in any workplace around this country. And taking all of this into consideration, I just do not understand how in the world the Labor Party think it is appropriate to abolish a body as important as the ABCC to keep this sort of union thuggery and bullying in check, to ensure that it does not occur in Australian workplaces. And if the Labor Party don't want to listen to the cases of the many women who have been relentlessly harassed by the, by the CFMMEU, well, they don't even want to listen to uh, the High Court of Australia, which ruled unanimously against that union uh, in a case about the union's lawlessness in the construction se sector brought by the ABCC, the very body we are discussing here this evening. The High Court found in the 2022 Patterns and Decision that the CFMMEU was a serial offender who engaged in whatever action and made whatever threats it wished without regard to the law. It had contravened laws on approximately 150 occasions. It was well resourced, having more than sufficient means to pay any penalty that the court might have been disposed to impose, and treated penalties for serious breaches of the law as just the cost of doing business. These are the people that the Australian Labor Party, this government, are prepared to defend and side with the lawbreakers and the thugs over Australian construction workers and businesses. And by promising to abolish the ABCC, they are condoning the CFMMEU's vile record of appalling treatment of women. Everyone deserves the right to go about their work in a safe environment. But the government seems to think that this doesn't apply to those working in our construction industry. It is an absolute shame. Mr Acting Deputy President, the ABCC is the last line of defence between a strong building sector and the chaos and the delays that are caused by a union-run Labor government. Because since the ABCC was re-established by the coalition in December 2016, the Commission has proved effective at tackling union excesses head-on. Our construction industry is a key component to Australia's economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. And I note that we've had a few heckles from the other side of the chamber about uh, the fact that uh, apparently we on this side don't 
understand anything about the construction industry and don't support the construction industry. I find that very hard to believe uh, after the very strong support that this government provided that very industry uh, over the last term of government uh, as we were uh, dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. But by promising to abolish the ABCC, Labor are putting that economic recovery at risk. And for what? Why are they doing this? Because they are beholden to their masters in the union movement. And heaven forbid the ABCC is doing its job effectively and holding unions to account for their atrocious behaviour. The CFMMEU or its representatives are respondents in 37 matters currently before the courts. Almost $2 million in penalties in the current financial year have been awarded against the CFMMEU and its representatives. On the other hand, while the unions are running around racking up fines and disrupting workplaces, the ABCC is, uh, has secured over $5 million in recovered wages and entitlements for construction workers since it was re-established in 2016, something that I would have thought those on the other side of the chamber would have been in strong support of, uh, and have made over $13.4 million in progress claims for subcontractors since 2019. This body is doing good work, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, to those listening at home, you shouldn't believe the rhetoric from those on the other side. The ABCC is a good thing, uh, and it just shows that it is an essential function for Australia's building and construction industry to combat union thuggery, end violence in the workplace and work to recover the wages and, enti and entitlements of hard-working Australians. So the question one must ask oneself, Mr Acting Deputy President, is why is this a priority for this Labor government? Well, it shouldn't come as a surprise that the CFMMEU was one of Labor's biggest financial donors in the financial year 2020-2021, providing them with nearly a million dollars in payments. And now, here they are, a Labor government pushing to abolish the ABCC, the very body that has tried to ensure that the CFMMEU ceases their lawless and thuggish behaviour on Australian work sites. This in no way passes the pub test. Does this government really think that Australians will look at this move and see it as anything other than a politically motivated attack against the ABCC? The truth is plain for everybody to see, and it has been put very eloquently by my colleagues in contributing to this debate this evening. Clearly, the Labor Party's allegiance is not to the Australian construction industry and not to the over 1.1 million Australian workers in that industry who just want to go to work and do their job and come home free from intimidation. No, Mr Acting Deputy President. Their allegiance is to the CFMMEU and those donations that they receive. I think we do need to consider here tonight, Mr Acting Deputy President, what will happen to the construction industry in the absence of the ABCC. Um, we've talked a lot about some of the behaviour that they've cracked down on. If we don't have this body, what is going to happen on Australian work sites? When there is no watchdog, industrial laws and penalties in this industry are seen as no more serious than a parking ticket. You speed. You pay the fine and the offending conduct is repeated again and again. But of course, in this example, we're not talking about speeding, we're talking about workplace intimidation, harassment of workers, particularly harassment of women, like I described only moments ago. The federal government, any federal government of any political persuasion, has a responsibility to ensure that our laws are strong enough to deter people from breaking the law and that there is an effective regulator in place to prosecute wrongdoers when they act unlawfully. When laws are repeatedly flouted and they're not acting as a deterrent, it is clear that those laws must be strengthened. When there is an effective regulator who enforces laws with meaningful penalties, people will think twice before breaking the law. As soon as Labor abolished the ABCC in 2012, the improvements in respect for the law were lost almost immediately. 
After that abolition, the rate of disputes in the construction industry rose to approximately four times the all industries average. In the first quarter, after the abolition of the ABCC, the rate of industrial disputes had increased by fivefold. And here we are, yet again, in 2022, and the Labor government, newly elected, one of their first priorities is to trash this body that was created to protect Australian workers from the coercive controls of the militant union movement. So after all of that, and after numerous speakers in this place tonight and previously on this motion when it was before the Senate back in August, uh, after those speakers have raised deep concerns about the government's move to abolish the ABC, about how this will adversely affect workers and how this will embolden militant unionism on construction sites around Australia, I certainly hope that the government will be prepared to do the brave thing and perhaps think twice about supporting the, uh, the CFMMEU and their union mates ahead of hard-working Australians. My hopes aren't high, Mr Acting Deputy President, but I certainly do have them. Because if they don't, if they side against the ABCC and with the CFMMEU, the Labor Party are condoning that union's abysmal record of the treatment of workers and particularly the treatment of women. And that is an absolute outrage. They are prepared to defend and side with lawbreakers and thugs over Australian construction workers and businesses because it is in their financial and political interests to do so. It is plain for all to see. This is a party and this is a government that talked a lot about integrity over the last few months during the election campaign and talked a lot about transparency. And I'm not entirely sure how those opposite on the government benches can talk about integrity on the one hand and in exactly the same breath almost in their first few weeks of government in this country instead be talking about siding with their union mates and abolishing the very body that has sought to make those, that union, those unions better and to make Australian work sites safer. It is just a disgrace. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr Acting President. Well, if ever we know the risks and dangers of electing Labor, this is it. This simply is a dirty deal. The abolition of the ABCC is the price Australians will pay for electing Labor, and might I say one of the many prices they will pay. This proposal is a dirty, rotten deal with a dirty, rotten union, the CFMEU. And I'm not referring to the members, many of whom are hardworking. I'm referring to the union bosses. And we've heard many excellent contributions from coalition senators this evening about the unlawfulness wreaked on building sites across this country by the CFMEU the hundreds upon hundreds of breaches of the law and the intimidatory uh, treatment to which so many are subjected by the CFMEU bosses, uh, including, of course, the disgraceful stories we've heard about the treatment of women. I want to particularly, in my um, more brief remarks, want to partic um, particularly pick up on the comments of Senator Ayres, and I'm pleased that Senator Ayres has acknowledged uh, the many instances of unlawful behaviour by construction unions. However, in saying that the ABCC is a failed regulator, Senator Ayres is completely and utterly wrong. That's absolutely false. And I want to refer to an excellent um, opinion piece by Danita Warne in the Australian Financial Review, um, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Master Builders Australia. And she reflects on a time when former Labor Prime Ministers, the former Prime Minister Hawke, Rudd and Gillard, stood up to militant construction unions. And this marks a very, very dark day 
for the Labor movement, led by the most left-wing Prime Minister in living memory. And the likes of Bob Hawke, Julia Gillard, Kevin Rudd had the guts to stand up to militant unions like the CFMEU and, in fact, the then Industrial Relations Minister back in 2008, Julia Gillard, commissioned the late Murray Wilcox to conduct an inquiry into the need for a specialist construction industry regulator. And in his report, uh, Wilcox concluded that the work of the ABCC is not yet done. I want to briefly put on record that it is quite false to assert that this regulator is failed. This regulator has done a very important job. And as Danita Warren writes, it is disingenuous in the extreme for people who know better to assert that the primary focus of the ABCC has been to stop construction unions flying their flags from the top of cranes. Since it was established in 2016, the ABCC has brought more than 100 cases to court and only one involved the display of construction union motives. Overall, as a result of the work of the ABCC, the courts have found more than 2,500 breaches of the law by construction unions, which resulted in more than $16.5 million in fines. The courts have found that to have been unlawful industrial action, more than 1,400 breaches resulting from more than 20 cases, leading to $3.6 million in fines. Coercion, more than 470 breaches resulting from more than 32 cases, leading to $5.9 million in fines. Right of entry, more than 300 breaches resulting from 40 cases, leading to $4.2 million in fines. Freedom of association, more than 120 breaches resulting from 15 cases, leading to $900,000 in fines and uh, unlawful picketing, more than 20 breaches resulting from four cases, leading to one, just over $1 million in fines, and finally misrepresentation, almost 30 breaches resulting from six cases, leading to $380,000 in fines. So this regulator has done a very good job at maintaining the law, at regulating the militant unions, and, of course, in ensuring that our construction sector thrives. And I do say shame on the Prime Minister, Mr Albanese, shame on Labor senators opposite, shame on the Labor movement for not having the same courage that the former Prime Minister, Bob Hawke, had, along with former Prime Ministers Rudd and Gillard, to stand up to the very worst elements of militant unions. The Labor Party, as I say, has done a rotten, dirty deal. This is our fifth largest industry, which employs more than 1.1 million workers, and Labor is happy to wind the clock back decades and put all of that at risk. And yes, they've got their dividend, $16.3 million in donations, and now they have the Labor Party on the hook to abolish the ABCC. This is an utter disgrace. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Senator Donningham. Deputy President, and look, uh, like my colleagues, I think it is a great opportunity to make a contribution on what is an important debate, uh, one that I think um, we need to boil back to the basics uh, rather than um, trying to head off in some of the tangents that uh, some of those opposite have made contribu contributions so far have. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, the ABCC had one job, and that was to protect those in the industry uh, who wanted to lawfully and safely go about their work. Um, and that is something that we are all for. And it, in fact, safe workplaces result in greater productivity, something that is great for uh, the people of Australia and indeed this economy, this one that has been through such a tough time over the uh, last couple of years especially. But when you talk about the construction sector in which 1.1 million Australians work, we have 400,000 small businesses registered operating in this sector, we need to make sure we have every 
uh, measure in place to ensure the protection of those who participate in this sector. It being a, a vitally important part of the economy, um, uh, both in built-up areas, uh, larger population centres, but also in regional communities, we need to make sure we have every uh, uh, protection in place for those who are part of that sector. But uh, we have to look at uh, the motivation behind the disempowerment of the ABCC. What is motivating the government to want to strip out the powers of this organisation, which really just does have one thing in mind, and that is the protection of workers, those who lawfully want to get about their business, uh, do their job to the best of their ability without the undue influence of uh, those who seek to interfere? What is it behind the ALP's motivations uh, to bring in uh, the measures that they have, the measure we are seeking to disallow today. And I think it's worth uh, hovering on that for quite some time, as my colleagues have, and there are a range of um, issues that have been raised that I'd love to ventilate in the time available to me, which I'm sure will run out tonight, but we'll pick up again at another time. But what is most disturbing about this debate is the minimisation of uh, what the CFMEU CFMMEU did and what the ABC took, ABCC took issue with and what the former government particularly focused on. Senator Dunningham, you will be in continuation. I propose the Senate now adjourn. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. <clears throat> Teachers change lives, and we often hear it, but I've always believed it. In July this year, a teacher from Montello Primary School in Burnie on the northwest coast of Tasmania received the honour of being named as one of 12 schools plus teaching fellows at the 2022 Commonwealth Bank Teaching Awards in Sydney. Daniel Edwards, an inspiring teacher from Montello Primary School in Burnie, has transitioned from a general classroom teacher to become a STEM specialist teacher. He's led a transformation in science and STEM education for students at Montello Primary. Montello Primary School is in a low socioeconomic area with high unemployment, and Daniel's passion has helped to generate a cultural shift in the students' engagement and achievements at Montello School. He is their first STEM specialist teacher and has helped develop the school's maker space room to provide new opportunities for students to engage in STEM activities. He has since coached teams from the school to the finals of prestigious state, national and even international STEM challenges, including the top three Tasmanian teams in the Australian Tech Girls competition. And another student from the school, Indy Wells, is an Asia-Pacific winner of the micro Bit Do Your Bit competition. These successes have generated widespread acclaim and driven new interest in STEM learning throughout Montello Primary School and into the wider community. These successes, uh, with Daniel's leadership, the school has received awards for greater participation and overall commitment to the Tasmanian Science Talents, Talent Search STEM Challenge and the TSTS competitions. One outstanding feature of Daniel's impact is his collaboration and sharings of knowledge with other schools. He has hosted STEM expos, volunteered as a judge for the National STEM Video Game Challenge and International Make X Sparks Robotics Competition and presented on best practices in STEM education at state and national conferences. Daniel's impact on education has been recognised by the 2021 Tasmanian STEM Primary Teacher of the Year Award and selection as the 2022 Tasmanian finalist for the BHP Science and Engineering Teacher Awards. Daniel said he felt he was on cloud nine after the Commonwealth Bank Teaching Awards and the opportunity to celebrate a group of 12 incredible with a group of 12 incredible newly named teaching fellows, 10 early career teachers who also received awards as a privilege. Indeed, he describes the energy and passion shared across the room at the awards as inspirational. This award also gave him the opportunity to meet many highly esteemed and inspiring educators from all around the country over the three days in Sydney. 
genuine connections and relationships were formed, and Daniel plans to continue working alongside others on some great ideas for projects, potential collaborations and visits to each other's schools. In Daniel's own, own words, he said, I'm so proud to be part of this team and I'm so excited about all the great and innovative things we can continue to achieve for our students. Thank you also to all the staff, students and wider community of Montello Primary School. There's not a place in the world I'd rather be or any other job I'd rather be doing. We're well and truly living up to our motto, making people shine. Every single day, students and staff at Montello are achieving incredible things and I couldn't possibly be any prouder to be playing a small part in that. I'm so inspired, challenged and encouraged with the knowledge that this fellowship will enable so many opportunities for our students beyond what I can even yet can't even comprehend. I want to take this opportunity to thank Daniel Edwards, as well as the amazing team at Montello Primary and, and the broader community of Burnie, for embracing STEM, for all their good work nurturing the minds of the children who will help lead Northwest Tasmania in years to come. So congratulations to Daniel and congratulations to Montello Primary School. Thank you. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Um, in my capacity as Shadow Minister for Communications, I've been very proud to speak about the incredible work of the coalition, the previous government, in protecting the online safety of all Australians. We have a very, very proud record. When we were in government, we passed the Online Safety Act and we established the world's first e-safety commissioner. We forced social media companies to remove cyberbullying, cyber abuse and image-based abuse. We stood up for children who had been bullied online and, of course, as we know, some of those cases resulted in absolute tragedy. We led global action to make social media companies more accountable over terrorist and violent content online. Uh, we committed to introduce new laws to unmask uh, anonymous trolls, which very regrettably were opposed by Labor. We implemented the News Media Bargaining Code to force the big tech platforms to pay for Australian media content, another world-leading reform. Following the Facebook Cambridge Analytica data harvesting scandal and in recognition of the new challenges to the protection of individuals' privacy in the digital age, in 2019 the Coalition committed to strengthen privacy protections by introducing a binding code of practice for social media and other online platforms. The Australian Competition and Consumer Commission's Digital Platforms July 2019 report reinforced the importance of the then government's commitment to develop a privacy code for uh, digital platforms um, and to enhance penalties and enforcement measures. And prior to the election, we uh, announced the Coalition's Privacy Legislation Amendment Enhancing Online Privacy and Other Measures Bill 2021, the Online Privacy Bill, which uh, proposed that social media and other online platforms would be required to take all reasonable steps to verify their users' age, uh, would consider the best interests of the child when handling the personal information of children, including obtaining parental consent for users under the age of 16. Uh, it also provided that um, there would be fully informed consent in relation to the use of personal information and that uh, social media platforms would be required to cease using or disclosing personal information upon request. We put Australians front and centre in that bill. The bill also proposed tougher penalties and enforcement powers, including penalties of up to $10 million for companies which engage in serious and repeated interferences with privacy. It is very regrettable that we have seen very little from Labor on online safety and online privacy. In fact, the now 
Labor Communications Minister, um, Ms Rowland, has barely mentioned online safety. And the Albanese government is to be condemned for its failure to strengthen online privacy and data protection laws. The Shadow Attorney-General, Julian Lisa, and myself uh, called for the Albanese government to adopt the Coalition's online privacy bill uh, back in July, and we have heard nothing but silence. And today I was pleased to join uh, Senator Patterson, the Shadow Minister for Cybersecurity and Countering Foreign Interference, along with Mr Lisa, calling on the Albanese government to take action. Uh, we have revealed today that a WeChat account holder, um, holder uh, has been asked to transfer this owner's data to WeChat services, servers on China's mainland. This account owner received a notice requesting authorisation to enable WeChat uh, which, to um, services which would result in personal information, likes, comments, views, search queries, and the, and the like are being uploaded by WeChat services in um, China's mainland for the sole purpose of providing this particular service. So uh, we have very real concerns and increasing concerns about online safety, online privacy and online security. Uh, these issues are extremely concerning. And in fact, uh, in July, Senator Patterson also wrote to the Minister for Home Affairs and Cyber Security, urging the government to consider all options to protect Australian users on high-risk platforms like TikTok. Now, the Home Affairs Minister has announced a review into data security issues, including data harvesting involving TikTok, TikTok WeChat and other digital platforms. But where is the government on taking immediate action to enhance the privacy of Australians online? Um, the Communications Minister has said nothing about this. She has completely vacated the field. Uh, now, while all regulatory options must be on the table, as the opposition has made clear, there are vital improvements to online privacy which can and must be enacted immediately. Um, we respect the fact that the Home Affairs Department is conducting its review. We are concerned that this is going to take such a long time and there will be no outcome of the review until early next year. But there is a tranche of legislation ready and um, willing to go. There is a tranche of legislation ready to go, I should say, because the privacy and safety of Australians online is critical. We know there are apps like TikTok which are data harvesting, are tracking young Australians, are capturing a whole lot of information which is in fact not necessary for the app to function as it should. And at the very least, we should be seeing action from the Albanese government in relation to children. So one of the provisions of the Coalition's online privacy bill was to require parental consent for any person under the age of 16 who signs up to an app. This is all about putting the best interests of children first. Uh, this bill also provided for very tough penalties of up to $10 million. So I say to the Albanese government, please have a look at this bill. Please consider that this is a critical issue. This is a rapidly changing landscape, and it's incredibly disappointing that we have seen no action um, from the government in relation to this very, very important issue. It is regrettably um, consistent with a lack of action we've seen uh, on a number of other fronts in the communications portfolio, including on regional connectivity. And before the election, a fabulous program, the Regional Connectivity Program, a proud coalition program, 
uh, we announced 93 projects spending $140 million to invest in improved regional connectivity in rural and regional communities around this country. We have been waiting more than three months and we have seen no action from the minister apart from saying in a, an interview with The Guardian that she intends to deliver the regional connectivity program, and, but it was only after I called her to account that she confirmed that round two would be delivered. But we do not know whether these 93 projects have been confirmed by the government. Nothing has been said. Nothing has been done. And these projects are sitting there on ice. And unfortunately, there is a very similar story with the Perry Urban Mobile Program. It was only after pressure in, uh, imposed by um, great local members, like the member for Casey, uh, when I visited him and talked about the Perry Urban Mobile Program, that the government announced it would commit $28.2 million to that program. But Labor went to the election with a $155 million cut to regional communications, $155 million less than the coalition's commitment. There's $140 million sitting in the budget, projects have been announced, and yet we've seen no action. So whether it's on regional connectivity, whether it's on privacy, whether it's on online safety and whether it's caring for our kids, we need to see immediate action from this government. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Henderson. Senator Barbara Pocock. Thank you, Madam President. Um, last week I attended the Jobs and Skills Summit here in this building, and it occurred, at a, occurred of course, at a critical moment in our history in terms of the state of our economy and our labour market. We're in a circumstance where wages have stalled and we've had 10 years without an increase in real wages. We have a broken system of enterprise bargaining. As academics at the summit pointed out, only 11 per cent of Australian workers in the private sector are now covered by enterprise agreements. We've got a gender pay gap that's too wide, unacceptably stuck. Um, at the level it's been at now for some decades, and we haven't narrowed it just in recent years, despite women's increasing participation in education. They're coming out of universities with more degrees, but we're not seeing an improvement in their pay. We've seen a massive shift in corporate power, reflected in the very high levels of profit as a share of GDP, while the wages share is at an all-time low. We face a crisis of inequality, too many kids left behind, a widening gap in salaries as top executives pull away with big pay rises and ordinary Australians uh, are stalled on falling real incomes. We face, in fact, a crisis in inequality with too many kids um, in households where there isn't enough food in the fridge. Too many people living in poverty um, and amongst uh, many of the working poor, insecurity of job, insecurity of hours, insecurity of shifts and too many Australians trying to live on income support at the level of $46 a day in a country that is amongst the wealthiest on the planet. So we have a cost of living crisis underway with prices outpacing wages growth and so many people under pressure trying to meet housing costs, rising rent, runaway transport, food, health and childcare costs. And in my own office in Adelaide, uh, issues around rent and housing uh, costs are amongst the most common that we're hearing on at present. At the same time, we have a crisis underway in our education system for many people with our kids coming out of universities with a level of debt now at an average of 24,000 and others struggling to find their way through a complex VET system, which also costs them a lot and results in very low rates of course completion for too many Australians. These outcomes are not random. They are not natural. They arise from public policy decisions, and they can be traced right back to John Howard in 1996 and subsequent governments who have taken policy decisions that have resulted in widening inequality, leaving too many Australians behind. We know that we can change these outcomes with different policies, and that's the challenge that was really at the front and fore of the summit in last week's conversations. It was a national conversation that this building hasn't seen for over a decade. Uh, which we have been much more commonly um, witnessed uh, conversations of corporate triumph and widening inequality. The summit pulled into it 
into the room some very unexpected voices, people who are living, for example, with disability, who had many things to say about how they're treated in the workplace, um, how difficult it is to find your way uh, into existing cultures in too many of our enterprises, young people and immigrants subject to discrimination and wage theft, and the challenge they find in trying to get justice, to re recover lost wages and often facing appalling treatment. The, the summit also witnessed the need to ensure that those who come to work here from overseas get access to full citizenship and permanency. Stories were heard of those living on income support and struggling to put together a life of care for themselves and their loved ones. An important and extended conversation about the situation of women, their ro low rates of labour participation, the double day so many face, um, with an unpaid uh, care load on top of a job and the absence of a quality, affordable early education uh, and childcare system, and alongside it, a very poor uh, level of paid parental leave. The price this creates not only for women and for children, but for households and for our economy. Of course, the value of the summit lies not so much in its conversations, but in what it achieves and the action that results. Women made up the first panel in the summit and the picture was grim. We've seen a big increase in the share of the services sector in our economy, in the care economy, a decline in agriculture and manufacturing, but without rewards flowing fairly to women. And we particularly saw repetitive conversations over the period of the summit on two issues that are incredibly important to the growing number of women who are holding jobs in Australian society. The first issue was early childhood education and care. It was perhaps the most commonly uh, mentioned issue by a wide range of participants, the need to invest more heavily in the care of our kids, to make access to childcare more affordable, to confront the childcare deserts which are peppered across our country, and to lift the pay of the, of the workers in the childcare sector and draw more people into a sector which is struggling to hang on to, let alone recruit, the growing number of carers uh, and skilled workers that that sector requires. The absence to invest properly, properly in this part of our economy and our society is resulting in much lower rates of participation for, of women relative to similar OECD countries and a big cost to our GDP and our country. And most importantly, it's affecting the quality of life and the long-term life chances of many of our kids. So we have a big agenda in front of us on childcare, and we really should be turning our attention much more aggressively and assertively towards policy that addresses this issue. The second really important question that was frequently discussed at the summit was the question of paid parental leave, the way in which we look after families and especially new parents and mothers at the moment of birth. I, I was um, lucky enough to work with Senator Natasha de Stott de Spoyer in 2001 when she brought to this Senate a private member's bill to establish the first paid parental uh, leave scheme. And uh, ten years after that private member's bill, Australia finally entered um, the developed world and gave uh, new parents, mothers, a paid rest uh, on the birth of a child. Ten years later, we find ourselves once again at the bottom of the international rankings in terms of the amount of paid parental leave we give to new parents. And we know from a very big and growing literature about the consequences of not, of not properly looking after kids when their parents are working as children are born. It has a big effect on their uh, cognitive capability later in life, and researchers in the US and internationally have shown that a dollar spent on the uh, providing leave, for example, for a mother and quality childcare uh, at a child's um, birth will result in a saving of $7 later in that child's life. This is the most important and lucrative investments we can make as a community, and we are failing to make those investments now, and we're paying a price, especially as women, in terms of access to economic um, uh, opportunity, but also in our economy and in terms of outcomes for our children. So the summit spent a lot of time looking at the circumstances and situation of women, and it created a very powerful argument for both investment in early childhood education and care and in paid parental leave. Very disappointingly, in the outcomes of the summit, which are many, and, and many of them 
uh, very laudable and dealing with a wide range of issues. They did not go to the questions of early childhood education and care or growing our paid parental leave system. And the real test for the summit outcomes for many women and families and households lies in giving uh, uh, relief from cost of living pressures through free childcare, which is something our um, country can, can afford right now in terms of um, the, the uh, stage three tax cuts, which could be so easily turned uh, to these kinds of investments, which make such a difference for women and our economy into the future. So thinking about the summit and its outcomes, uh, a very important and valuable period of discussion but the real test lies in whether we're able to make advances on some of the most discussed issues at the summit and issues which the many women in that room, they made up half the delegates in this conference, a, a big contrast with the 1983 Hawke and Keating summit where only one of the 93 delegates was woman. So women were there, they were heard, they spoke up. The test is, will we see action on some really important areas of change and will we see the investment of the stage three tax cuts in these kinds of provisions that make such a difference for women and really address gender inequality. Um, we can contrast positive outcomes for women out of better childcare outcomes and paid parental leave with the fact that those stage three tax cuts will deliver $2 for men to every $1 they give to women. So a lot of challenges there for us. The proof will be in the pudding. I hope we're gonna see much stronger action in coming budgets um, for, for the women of Australia. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pocock. And just for future re reference, just address me as president. Uh, Senator Ayres. Thanks, uh, President. Um, tonight, um, on behalf of uh, former Senator uh, Fear of Anti Wells, I pay tribute to a great figure within the Australian Italian community, Cavalieri Giovanni Battista De Bellis, OAM. Mr. De Bellis lost his short battle with cancer late last year after a life devoted to his family his work and his community. Senator, former Senator Fear of Andy Wells prepared this speech. Any errors, um, of course, are just in my uh, delivery. Uh, she wanted me to acknowledge in particular Mr De Bellis's children, Nick, Mary, Frank and Gianni, the president of the COASIT board, Lorenzo Fazzini, uh, the general manager, Thomas Camparialli, as well as uh, Mr De Bellis's numerous friends and colleagues. Mr De Bellis was born on the 22nd of July 1938 in the town of Acquaviva del Fonte in the province of Bari, Italy. Like many Italian migrants, he lived through World War II and experienced famine and hardship. Uh, those early experiences taught him to value community, relationships and family. Quite unusually for the time, Mr De Bellis went on to graduate from technical college, having attained an accounting diploma in 1959. In May 1961, uh, he followed one of his brothers who had already made the decision to come to Australia. Although Mr De Bellis came to Australia with what he described as school English, he found it hard to make any sense of the Australian accent. He moved from job to job after initially settling, settling in Marrickville in Sydney. In his second year, he commenced work with Subimo, the building arm of the Transfield Group of Companies. He'd spent 34 years with that company, ultimately as accountant, group administration manager and ultimately group financial controller. He retained that role until his retirement in 1996. In the early 1960s, Mr De Bellis, like many other young Italian migrants, would spend his Saturday nights at the Trocadero in Sydney or the town hall events at both Marrickville and Petersham. It was at the Italo Australia Club in George Street that he first met the love of his life, Justina, in 1962. He asked her to dance, and with the approval of her brother, she agreed. Before long, a relationship blossomed, and they married the following year. Mr De Bellis's devotion for Justina was immense. They frequently attended Coazit events, including the gala balls. Elegantly attired, they were the envy of all on the dance floor with their dancing prowess. Sadly, Justina suffered a brain aneurysm in 2001. Mr De Bellis devoted himself to her care, cooking, cleaning, feeding and supporting her in every way. She would sometimes get confused or agitated and he had a way of calming her, sometimes with just a smile and other times with a reassuring comment. They were inseparable, even as her cognition declined. He spoke about her with such fondness 
about her mothering, her care for the family and her strength of character. He prioritised Justina's needs and care above all else and for a long time managed without any support at all. Uh, ultimately, uh, he allowed Coazit to bring in some care, first for Justina and later for him as well. Despite his best efforts to visit her in aged care, COVID restrictions made that almost impossible for a large part of 2020 and 2021. This really affected him uh, uh, very deeply. His uh, cancer diagnosis in October 2021 was a shock to everyone except for Mr DeBellis himself. He rarely spoke about his prognosis. He just wanted to be at home, relaxing in his favourite armchair or smoking on his balcony like he always did. And despite a brief admission uh, to hospital, he got this wish. If uh, Mr DeBellis's first love was Justina, uh, Senator Fear of Andy Wells says that his second love was Coazit, the peak Italian community organisation in New South Wales. Established in 1968 by the Italian Consul General of the day, it has grown to lead the provision of care to people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. Initially founded to maintain the Italian language for the children of migrants, Coazit soon began providing immigration-funded settlement services and community events. Uh, it's now a major provider of home care packages, Commonwealth home support services, mental health services, drug and alcohol, problem gambling, as well as youth and family services. With a staff of 230, 7,000 students and over 2,000 clients, Coazet is a highly regarded entity in New South Wales indeed. Mr DeBellis got involved with Coazet in the early to mid-1970s. By 1978 he joined the board and served as its treasurer from 1983 until 2020, when he took on the role of assistant treasurer and as convener of the education subcommittee until it was disbanded in 2004. As convener, he fought for the maintenance of Italian language education programs in the primary school system in New South Wales. It is in large part thanks to his commitment that Italian is what is so widely taught in schools in New South Wales. He served as a director of Coazit for almost 50 years, education subcommittee convener for 30 years and treasurer for 37 years. Uh, an immense commitment to public service and volunteer organisation indeed. His skills as an accountant ensured the financial stability and longevity of the company, but his business acumen ensured its continued growth and success. He was involved in every key decision that the organisation made in almost 50 years, and it is a mainstay in New South Wales, particularly in Leichhardt uh, in Sydney. He was involved in many key milestones, including the negotiations for the purchase of Casa Italia in Leichhardt, the establishment of the Italian Bilingual School and the purchase of the Cultural Centre at the Italian Forum, uh, all of these, of course, in the Prime Minister's very own seat of Grandla. In an interview in April 2018, Mr DeBellis was asked why he maintained his involvement with Coazit for so many years. He answered by saying that he valued the maintenance of language and culture and the care of our older community. He said, there's got to be a passion. You wouldn't do it otherwise. In the early days, I had a wife and four children at home. I would work all day and then go to a meeting at Coazit and get home at 11 o'clock or midnight. If that's not passion, I don't know what is. For all of his efforts, Mr DeBellis was awarded the Order of Australia Medal in 2012 and the Order of Cavalieri by the President of the Italian Republic in 2019. Four days before his death, Mr DeBellis received the Coazet Medal for his extraordinary contributions to that organisation and to the broader Italian-Australian community. He attended the end-of-year function with pride and received a medal that meant so much to him and that he was involved in establishing three decades earlier. Just a few weeks later, that medal sat on his coffin as an acknowledgement that Coazit stands so tall in large part because of Mr DeBellis uh, and he, indeed his family's contribution to the organisation. Connie wanted me to acknowledge 
all of the COASIT staff involved in, in Mr De Bellis's care, but especially his case manager, Alessandra, and his care workers, Ernesta and Simona. Um, how does one sum up the legacy of such a generous and compassionate man who gave so selflessly of himself to the Italian-Australian community and to the Australian community at large? I know I speak not just for former Senator Fear of Andy Wells, but for many in the community and at Coazit who will continue his legacy by following the example of care and support he showed to his organisation and to his family and that he taught others to show. This legacy lives on in the care for the organisation, the care for the community and the success of the Italo-Australian community. Vale Giovanni de Bellis. Thank you, Senator Ayres. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 12 noon.